Adam Harvey is a Berlin-based artist, researcher, and I would say, you can correct me uh, if you want to, um, that his topic is how, how to disappear or how to be invisible or how to be at least unrecognized in a world of surveillance. Um, he designs stealthware, for example. What that is and uh, what his mission is, he's going to tell us by himself. We, well, welcome you, um, Adam. We're glad that you're here. Good, left to right here. Okay. Sorry about that. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me, whoever did invite me. And uh, it's nice to be here to share some of the things that I've been thinking about and working on for the last few years, really. So I'm gonna start with a slide and uh, kind of work my way into talking about three main issues, which are uh, three main topics. Uh, I don't want to call them issues. That sounds a little negative. But computer vision, camouflage, and visual metadata. And I'm framing it uh, for this talk in terms of low-resolution discoveries. What you can do with a very small amount of data I think is surprising. Um, so a little bit of background. I recently moved here. Uh, used to live in New York and did a lot of uh, computer vision kind of related art and explorations into counter surveillance. In this talk, I wanted um, to bring up the idea of camouflage, but a more contemporary perspective on camouflage and actually move away from this representation, which I think is too, uh, too common and also too misleading. And it's misleading because well, if you wear this kind of camouflage, you know, which allows you to blend into the woods, or if you wear the most popular pattern, which is now associated with Vietnam era protest, uh, M81 woodland pattern, you don't really blend into anything because people live now in urban areas. Uh, the only thing you blend into is other people wearing the same camouflage. But I put this one on here because uh, what's interesting is that it shows an evolution in camouflage. Uh, in terms of uh, a dual perception way of thinking about it. And so it's fluorescent orange, right? So it's very apparent to us, to people. Fluorescent orange is used for hunters, and fluorescent orange can't be seen by the animals that are being hunted. And so you're, you're allowed to exist in two perceptual states when you wear this garment, fluorescent orange visible to humans, yet it turns gray, when it's viewed by uh, the observer in that situation. So I think that shows, uh, it's very, I think, more modern kind of camouflage than looking at the very tired, outdated uh, 20th century M81 woodland pattern, which, sorry, I don't have a picture of. Um, camouflage, though, didn't always enjoy uh, the pop culture status that it does now. So camouflage, if you look back early in the 20th century, to the beginning of World War I, camouflage was a term for criminals. Cr uh, camouflage was a had a lot of negative connotations to it. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt uh, once called it a form of effeminate cowardice, a mere defensive strategy that all but announced an unmanly desire to hide instead of fight. So you can see here that camouflage was thought of as being defensive as being weak. That's not how we think of camouflage today. As World War II continued, people realized that camouflage was actually uh, a very good strategy, um, very smart, savvy approach to modulating your visibility and controlling the amount of information uh, that you release to others. So we can think about this uh, in the same way that we can think about privacy now. That privacy, <coughs> that privacy is about, um, in the cypherpunk manifesto definition, you know, the power to uh, selectively reveal oneself to the world. And I think there's a nice parallel between that interpretation of privacy and 
the way that uh, Anne Elias is writing about camouflage here, that privacy is actually you know, a sign of humanity's increasing intelligence, to put it into more of a positive light. That, that slide didn't come through. Um, without knowledge, though, perception, uh, without knowledge of perception, appearance becomes irrational. So this is uh, there's some new material that, that I'm kind of trying out tonight. Unfortunately, it's not uh, comedy material, but um, the idea here is it's very difficult to know how to appear when you don't know how you're being observed. So without knowledge of the observation technology, without observation of the ways that knowledge is extracted from images, that uh, the only um, the only way you can appear is irrational. Then what I was saying that without the knowledge of the ways they're being observed, without the knowledge of your appearance, uh, that appearance becomes irrational. Looking back at the first camera, the daguerreotype, literally photography was recording of light. Now uh, photography and image making is much more that uh, images and, and knowledge from those images is being extracted through the relationship to other images in big data repositories, showing here just a neural network uh, a workflow. So that to appear with face paint on, that allows you to blend into the jungle or the woodland, uh, becomes in some ways an outdated mode of appearing because much observation is carried out with computers and with algorithms, and in fact, Putting face paint in your face doesn't even hide your face from face detection. But you wouldn't know that unless you're aware of that type of observation. So the knowledge of appearance uh, becomes asymmetrical. Uh, we don't know what other people know, and it's not that anyone can know everything. It's that it's become incredibly complex that uh, no, a full knowledge of all the different ways of appearance, uh, I'm going to keep arguing, is leads to irrational ways of appearing. In this uh, slide here, what you see is the gaze or the saliency of a machine vision algorithm. So this is a representation of what a computer vision algorithm is using to classify that image. So it's the useful parts of that image that are used to reach the conclusion that there is a cat in that image. And this is a progression of, in the top left, a merely statistical way of looking at it where there are no relational insights to uh, data in a, in a machine learning data set. And the evolution going to the most recent one from 2016 which is called deep saliency, it finds the, the perfect shape and fully uh, silhouettes the cat shape. So there's also here you can see uh, kind of a rapid evolution of computer vision's ability to, to understand and quickly isolate the useful parts of an image. Um, and it's also irrational because you don't know where you exist. Uh, this slide is from the Microsoft Celebrity dataset, uh, dataset paper, which shows approximately how many facial images are in the training sets from Google, Facebook. Ours, in this case, refers to uh, the Microsoft uh, Celebrity Database. But what you should know about this is that uh, these are all public images that are either creatively licensed or the researchers are using the assumption that because these people are celebrities, that they are in the public domain, that their image is in the public domain. But not to get too far on that, I mean, what defines a celebrity? Is it anybody with a Twitter account? Is it anybody who has posted a photo online? Because that uh, leads to some problems. But when you look at the number of 10 million facial images, then uh, I'm not sure there are that many celebrities. I don't know also you know, how I exist and how I'm being observed in the way that <coughs> my state of being can be observed and extracted, such as in this 
um, the research paper from this year, 2016, they're just looking at somebody's social media image and being able to understand uh, not only apparent things like age, race, and gender, hair color, eye color, but also, you know, looking almost reading it from the inside. So whereas facial recognition, you could say, treats the face as an index to your identity, uh, these algorithms that are being mentioned here, um, analyzing more of your mood, uh, your state of being, they try to read you from the inside. So in previous work, we'll just mention quickly to situate where I'm going here. You know, I looked at kind of new ways of appearing of modulating visibility uh, with a project called CV Dazzle, which uses uh, hair and makeup to um, obscure key facial features. And these key facial features are determined by reverse engineering the profiles that are used for face detection. So in this case, the reverse contour on the cheek is inverting uh, kind of a high priority facial feature on the cheekbone uh, and also covering the, the nose bridge and the paraocular area is also a, a high confidence uh, key facial feature. And in another project, you know, imagining now also it's not just visible wavelength, but it's thermal. How do you appear in multiple uh, perspectives, multiple wavelengths? and still be able to modulate your visibility. This project uses silver-plated textiles that are reflective to heat. And so you could do this also um, literally for 99 cents with an aluminized mylar space blanket. Uh, functionally, you have the same effect of shielding and reflecting heat, but in this case, uh, there's no crinkle. It's a drapeable fabric and it gets closer to wearability. As you can see, a lot of the images are very, you know, draped and they can be um, sewn into, into fashion. And this one is the anti-drone burqa. Okay, so <laughs> uh, this is the new material, which I've warned you is not funny. But um, this is, this is about looking at data uh, at very low resolutions and trying to understand, you know, from without moving too far ahead into all these neural networks, how much data are we sharing when we share data? Um, what, how are we appearing when we share images and what's contained in images? And I'll just start here with the letter M, which is very boring. Um, the letter M in Time is New Roman at 48 point. So you can take this image, you can reduce it to one pixel. And at one pixel, it becomes a number between zero and 255. And if you take every character, every glyph in the Times New Roman set, and you do that same averaging all the pixels in the glyph block, you get all these. And 97% of these characters in their one pixel representation are unique. And you can plot it and it looks like this, where you have the average pixel intensity of every character, A to Z, capital A to Z, and zero to nine. And then you can reduce it to the variance and see that, um, interestingly, the least unique character is lowercase q, and the most unique character is a capital M. And you can see in the plot, it shows how much it varies according to the other characters in the, in the glyph set. So <coughs> then you can, you can look at times and room in a new way and say that yeah, I have these takeaways. M is the most unique, Q is the least unique, and overall pretty much every character is unique when you look at it this way. So when you're writing something, you know, and pixelating it, you have to account for the fact that there's a lot of information there, and that can be exploited. And in this example, I'll walk you through, it's going to be hard to see here, um, but uh, six, a two by six pixel grid. There's a word hidden in here in terminus font and you can extract that word <coughs> in half a second um, just using a genetic algorithm approach. So if you're with the first generation and you can see what it's doing is like a hill climb algorithm slowly moving towards 
the optimal solution. And the optimal solution is the name that was pixelated, which is Ernest. But you can't see that. But you can see that. So it exists. It's there. It's hidden. And if you understand you know, how much information is hidden within 255, 256 you know, levels of tonality in a single pixel, it's actually a lot of information hidden there. So uh, I'll kind of move towards a summary and um, look briefly at how much information is hidden in very low resolution. So simple, one pixel, 256 values. Uh, two by two changes a lot. 256 to the fourth, now we have four billion combinations represented in an image so small that you would never make. At just four by four pixels, it's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. Um, again, too small of an image for anyone to really bother with. And at 16 by 16, we can be begin to represent people's identities. Does anybody know who this is? Just shout it out. Who? Uh, I'll give you a hint. Revenant. Yeah. <laughs> so 16 by 16 is all that's needed to encode somebody's identity. And at 20 by 20, these are kind of what are called the synthetic activations. This is the profile, one of four main profiles that are used in OpenCV's face detection. So now we have 256 to the 400th power, which is very large, which is pretty much infinity. Um, but you can see this is like the optimal face that's represented within the face detection profile. You do the same thing for the other profiles. So these are the faces that are encoded through the training sets that the OpenCV face detector has learned from. And they're only 20 by 20 pixels. And this is the profile. So if you squint, they're a little bit easier to see. And this is the default. You know, basically it follows if you take a photo, you know, reduce it, amplify the contrast, you can see the key facial features also that you would recognize, things like eyes, nose, cheek, and basically the oval outline are still uh, able to be represented at 20 by 20 in here or 24 by 24. So, okay, then I'm really moving towards a summary now. Um, text characters can be visually unique at one pixel, one pixel resolution. We saw 97% with Times New Roman. I haven't yet done it with all other fonts, but that would be worthwhile to see. The minimum size for facial recognition is about 16 pixels. And I've heard uh, at a biometrics conference, the minimum size uh, for detecting a face was 12 pixels, which sounds really low, but the person who said that was from the NSA. A 12 by 16 pixel image is enough to encode human behavior. So this is uh, from a new research paper that came out um, this month that looks at, um, you know, in a good way, how to preserve privacy through reducing the resolution of images. People are sharing 640 by 640 resolution images on Instagram, and that sounds kind of cheap in comparison to the quality that you capture with a phone or with a camera, you know, 10 megapixels, 12 megapixels. But here we have just 12 by 16, and we can encode uh, a wide range of human activity. And at merely 20 by 20, an image can contain nearly every possible representation of the human face. So going back then to one of the slides in the beginning, uh, that was from a text by Dr. Ann Elias uh, at the University of Sydney, I think. And she mentioned, you know, as World War II increased, people really caught up with the time and realized how important camouflage was. But it took, it took 40 years for people to get with the program and realize that camouflage uh, was so empowering. So 
given the magnitude of observation and the, ab the, the new really enormous ability for neural network computer vision systems to extract knowledge and insights from images, how you know, will we look back on our response to these new observation systems, data collection systems, in uh, 20 21, 16, and what will we think of our, of our progress then? So that, that is all. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot. Any questions? Comments? the first part so we may have answered this but with the hello yes um, with this sort of technology and the ability to put passive capture systems in place is there any so presumably if a small passive camera running off a watch battery could capture something like this what is the biggest hindrance right now to making to every st surveillance system in the world having this? Is is it pinging back against the server to actually have these backend facial recognition databases online and be able to run them in a frame by frame rate, or is it just a matter of time before everybody has this technology and we're fucked? There, there are some some bottlenecks, thankfully. Um, there's a lot of uh, computational power required to, to run a lot of these. And that's why, you know, one of the ones I mentioned is this OpenCV algorithm that's 15 years old. And people say it's not the most robust algorithm, but it's one of the most efficient algorithms. And that's why people still use it. And so you can use other ones that do, you know, what's called HOG, which is histogram of oriented <coughs> gradients. It's, it's an upgrade, it gives you a better result but at the cost of more computational um, power. So the question that people are asking is how much power, money, infrastructure do you invest and what do you get out of it? And I think that depends on how people are uh, adapting facial recognition into products. If there's a lot of consumer demand, then those bottlenecks will decrease. And we'll see uh, more demand means better facial recognition and more infrastructure devoted to it. Um, the other bottleneck, I think, is that everybody wants, from a corporate perspective, not mine, everybody wants access to more intimate uh, kinds of photos, I mean, more private photos. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I can give one interesting example. So this is a company called Jetpack. And what Jetpack did is scan every public pixel of Instagram and they use that to build a visual guide for cities. Uh, and what I mean is they're able to see which bars hipsters went to. I don't know why you'd want to go to that bar, but that was where people had you know, m curly mustaches and trucker hats. And you can extract that knowledge from photos on Instagram. Um, and conversely, uh, for the females, they would look at cues like lipstick and they would try to you know, identify bars where girls were going that might be single girls. So if guys want to find a bar, they would look for this you know, bar that had a high confidence score for a lot of girls going out. This is not my interpretation of it. This is what they advertise. Um, the, funny part, the other funny part about it is that Jetpack uh, was acquired by Google. Instagram is Facebook. Uh, Jetpack basically sold uh, Facebook to Google, which is brilliant, uh, besides the computer version part of it. <laughs> that was silly. All right, any more questions or comments? Otherwise, I have a question actually. Looking at how slowly we as a society are understanding the capabilities of these techniques, are there any, or do you know any, 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 any tries to tackle this in sort of 
in form of regulation, political regulation of these new forms. Is there anything like, like we're slowly starting to, to talk about how we can regulate algorithms and machine learning and stuff? Is there anything happening uh, in this area? Uh, <coughs> yeah, that's, I think, a field where there are a lot of discoveries to be made in, in figuring out the black boxes of these algorithms. Um, in terms of regulation, I only laughed because there was a multi-stakeholder meeting for regulating this in the U.S., and it pretty much fell apart. The EFF and a lot of other privacy uh, activist groups were attending it, and they said that this is just uh, going nowhere and stalling. And it ended up being overridden with lobbyists uh, working on behalf of, of companies. And so there aren't many, if any, regulations on, on facial recognition now. There is one in Illinois that is being contested now. And that, not sure how this will play out because it prevents, it, it makes it illegal to store biometric information. Well, you look at a photo, that any photo that contains a person is a biometric photo. <laughs> so that's that's a lot of that's a lot of um, cleanup work to do. <laughs> okay. If there's not another comment or question, then let's say thanks a lot uh, for this interesting talk <laughs> to Adam Harvey.